go to sleep, and I drink about a double dose of this. Consult your physician first, but I, I take a good, goodly dose of it. Uh, if you take it with knockout, though, whoa, I wouldn't do that because the two combined, <laughs> I've done that. Uh, but I tell you, knockout works like a charm. It's back in. This is how we fund the operation. I mean, we've set out to bring in the most hardcore, affordable products out there that are true game changers. So some of them are just famous you know, staples that we've tweaked from major manufacturers that are high quality. Others are game changers that we've basically invented. Like DNA Force. Absolutely. DNA Force, 20% off, InfoWarsLife.com. Okay, in the few minutes we got left, Anthony, uh, I, I know you're going to be hosting the show uh, tomorrow in the fourth hour, uh, but let's get into this other news. So 28 years for Salmonella, a peanut executive has been sentenced to 28 years, which is pretty much a life sentence for him. Did he really know they were shipping it out? That's apparently, crazy. Apparently, but it's really just to make a statement to everyone else, right? This is really just to scare food producers. A federal judge handed Parnell a 28-year prison sentence, the toughest penalty ever for a corporate executive in a food poisoning outbreak. He's 61, and unless he wins an appeal, he will serve out most of his term. His brother and food broker also received a 20-year sentence, and the plant's quality assurance manager was given five years. So that's a big deal. And then here's one. Here's a quote. Although his sentence is less than maximum, it is the longest sentence ever in a food poisoning case. The but, but did he admit, because I followed it some, but couldn't find out, did he admit that he knowingly did it? It's really, really complex. I don't Here's an example, though. Hospitals cover up deadly uh, fungus, kills a bunch of people. That's in the news. They don't get in trouble. Well, meanwhile, I was going to say also, big drug manufacturers, like it just came out that the Paxil metadata showed that it caused suicide in teens. But they just pay fines and no one cares or Pfizer pays fines. So the point is they selectively burn people when they want because that guy was a smaller manufacturer. They're setting the precedent to go after little guys. Well, it, it, that. That's how Tyson shut down all the other chicken producers. There's a bigger piece, too. There's an article in Forbes that says FDA needs more funding. And it came out because of this. So they're going to say, hey, there was salmonella in this peanut, in this peanut butter. We need to get more money for the FDA and bureaucratic systems to look at everybody harder. We need to have more billions of dollars for this or else people are going to die. Meanwhile, Big Pharma does whatever they want and kills everybody. But it's like, oh, there was salmonella and peanut butter. We need to get more funding for the FDA immediately. More bureaucracy. But if you're Tyson, you can have thousands of violations. You don't get in trouble. But a small mom and pop, you're shut down for one. Exactly. It's setting a precedent. Big corporations do what they want. The chickens sit in generations of their own feces. That's fine. Not a bit. Monsanto does whatever they want. Uh, simply insane. Thank you, Anthony Gucciardi. Great job. More on that tomorrow when he hosts the fourth hour of Overdrive. Peter Schiff coming up. But first, some of your calls. We have loaded phone lines. Folks want to talk about the Pope's visit. At the bottom of the hour, I'll go to you, and you can each have about 30 seconds a minute to give your comment on it and how it affects the economy. We'll get Peter Schiff's take on it at that point. But he's with us for the hour, uh, the head of uh, EuroPacificCapital.com, uh, by the way, uh, billions under management, to break down the fact that he accurately predicted six months ago, three months ago, a month ago, uh, that the Federal Reserve would not raise interest rates. Now they're saying it might come in a few months. And I was talking when I was in Omaha over the weekend where there is a Federal Reserve-based uh, bank system. I was talking to someone who works for the Federal Reserve. I'm just going to leave it at that. And they said, at least from their Fed head, that they didn't think it was a good idea that rates hadn't gone up and that they were uh, pressuring uh, out of uh, that particular uh, based bank uh, that's tied into Kansas City, uh, but that the Omaha branch was pressuring them to raise interest rates. And I told this Federal Reserve official um, that I thought that Peter Schiff and others were right that they couldn't raise them because that would really make the economy implode. Obviously, Peter Schiff has said they should raise them, uh, but they're not going to raise them, and he's been proven right yet again. So uh, Peter Schiff joins us, Europac.com. Now, we're going to then also get into um, some of the other reports that tie into this whole cashless society control grid. Intelligent car seat detects driver's stress level. That's Reuters and, of course, reports it to the police. Migrant crisis in Euro tension threatens to trigger catastrophic conflict, claims experts. Uh, also, trade-off. Greeks turn to barter as country runs out of cash. Another report. Fighting for pedophilia. It's official. U.S. government policy to allow Afghan allies to rape little boys. You cannot make this up. 
And now Democratic Party connected publications like Salon are coming out saying, don't be mean to pedophiles, it's only their sexual attraction. It, it's, it's their persuasion. Don't be hateful. So what if your persuasion was torturing women to death? Would that be okay? I mean, I was watching this video from a university uh, with feminists saying basically all sex is rape. And university reports 23% of women have been patted or kissed at parties and that that's rape now. So, so men patting a woman on the rear end at a drunken party is rape. But body parts of babies being sold, that's no big deal. Uh, and pedophilia being promoted, that's okay. And putting transgender bathrooms in to confuse kids is okay. I mean, this is a takeover that is taking place. And I, I, I'm all over the map here. Uh, I've never really asked Peter Schiff his take on the moral decline of this country. I know he's kind of a paleoconservative slash libertarian, was Ron Paul's chief advisor in his first campaign. Uh, but, you know, us libertarians are live and let live. But we're being conquered by the cultural Marxist who really are driven by their need to overthrow everything good and decent. And so I want to get into your prediction becoming you know, accurate and true yet again, where you see the economy going so much more, the pubs visit, phone calls, whole nine yards, whole shooting match. But first off, culturally, Peter Schiff, uh, you know, as a father, as a husband, uh, as a patriot, I mean, do you, ever, do you ever scratch your head and think how much worse can it get? I mean, are liberals really this sick and freakish? Uh, in their behavior. I don't know if you've seen the article suddenly now the new movement is pedophilia. Uh, what is your view on just all the craziness? Well, look, I don't know how much worse it's going to get, but you know, I wanted to go over with you how much worse it's gotten for my father. And this probably shows you where we are at a nation when this is how we treat our, our prisoners. And of course, remember my, my dad being a political prisoner, but he's nonviolent. And I want to just for a book he wrote, for a book he wrote, the judge said 10 years ago, you won't go to prison if you stop printing the book and stop speaking. Your father said no. A true political prisoner like North Korea, please continue, Erwin Schiff. So let me tell you what happened. So I went and visited him. I hadn't seen him in a while because, you know, they isolated him out in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, supposedly because he could get better medical care there. This is the irony of it. He used to be at a place called Otisville, which was in New York, close to my house, easy to visit. Uh, no long lines. He liked it. Um, he, you know, there was a huge Jewish population there. He was like the cantor rabbi. You know, he, he, he was enjoying his uh, captivity to the extent that you can. But when he turned 80, which was seven years ago, they said, well, you're too old to be at Otisville. You need to be in this special camp. And they sent him first to Tyler Haute, Indiana. Uh, and then to Fort Worth, Texas. But of course, he rarely gets visitors because he doesn't know anybody. Uh, you know, I had to take a plane, rent a car. It's a big deal. And by visit. the way, to interrupt you, Terre Haute is the maximum security execution center. So they sent him to the most well, hard. They also have a they have a lower security facility. He wasn't he wasn't yeah. there. But it's not the camp that he was at in, in Otisville. But in any event, so I went to visit him. And the way it works in this prison is depending on what your prison number is, if it ends in an odd number or an even number, you can either visit on a Saturday or a Sunday. You can't visit on both days because a lot of people want to visit their loved ones on the weekends, and so they split it up. So my dad happened to be on a Saturday. Now also they have visiting Friday night. So I booked my plane reservation about a week ago. I flew in Friday to visit him Friday night. I was gonna see him Saturday day. You get about six or seven hours on Saturday. Friday night is gonna be a two day visit. So I got there on Friday evening for the scheduled visiting hours. And when I get there, there's nobody there. And there's a couple of guards there. And they said, well, why are you here? And I said, well, I'm here to visit my father. He's an inmate. And they said, oh, uh, you know, we don't do evening visits anymore. Uh, we changed that last week. And I said, well, gee, why didn't you say something about it? I mean, I looked at the website. I called up. No one said anything. And they said, well, you know, we put a sign out front. And I said, well, a sign out front, what good does that do me? I can't see from Connecticut your sign here in Fort Worth. I mean, these guys couldn't care less that people are making arrangements based on the visiting hours. And then they just changed them abruptly without note, without any advance Total notice. Total arrogance. Yeah. In fact, when I went back to my hotel room that night, I checked the website and it still had the visiting hours being Friday night. They still haven't even put on the, on the website that they changed it. So anyway, I came back the following morning 
And I got there when it started. And of course, it's not even that long a line, maybe 40 people. It took me two hours to get in the front door. You know, I mean, two hours on a line that wasn't that long. That's how slow they process. Meanwhile, in the parking lot is now filled, you know, because of some Obama mandate, all federal buildings have to have uh, covered parking with solar panels. And they're spending a fortune covering the parking lots with solar panels. Meanwhile, you know, there, there's, there's no benches to even sit down when you're standing, you know, waiting for two hours. But when I finally got in there, they pulled me aside and they said, oh, we got some news for you. So you can't just go right in and, and visit. Now, I have no idea what it is. As far as I know, maybe my father died. So I'm waiting another 20 minutes or so in this little room for some woman to come out to tell me why I can't visit my father. And it turns out that he had been admitted into the hospital the day before. And of course, they'll never tell you when they bring your loved one to the hospital, because theoretically, that's when we can plan the escape. See, if they told us that they were taking my father to the hospital, we could you know, you know, know, try to ambush the ambulance and, and break him out of jail. So to make sure that we don't do that, they don't say anything. So they tell me my father is in jail. In, and by the way, the your hospital. dad has cancer. We need to add that. Yes, he has cancer. So I go to the hospital. And first of all, in order to get into his room, there's two armed guards right by his door. Armed guards guarding my dad. He's 87 and he's almost blind. He could, he could, in fact, he couldn't even see my face. He could just see a blurry outline of my face. Of course, if they had taken care of his eyes, he probably has really bad cataracts, but maybe he could see. But in any event, they have two armed guards. We're paying taxpayers to guard my 87-year-old father. And I get in there, he's shackled to the bed, right? He's got, he's got a handcuff around his ankle, and he's, you know, he's shackled to the bed. But the thing is, he, and he's in, he's in really bad shape. And here's, this is the, the, the worst part about it. So I got to talk to a doctor who had been examining him, and probably I never would have been able to speak to this doctor had I not been in the hospital at the time. And the doctor first tells me that my father, when he was originally diagnosed with cancer, according to the prison records, he refused treatment. Now, my father screamed like, no, I didn't. Why would I ever refuse treatment? Somehow, because my father told me, I said, well, what's the treatment that they're recommending? And they told him, there's nothing we can do. There's no treatment. But now, according to the records, my father refused treatment. So they dummied the records true. up. It's just a total collapse of civilization, not caring, but, total fraud. Yeah, yeah, but here's the worst part. So the doctor tells me now that the cancer has spread, and she shows me his CAT scans, and that the cancer has spread to all these other organs in his body, Jesus. not just his lungs. But she also says, you know, look at his head. She sees these uh, marks, and she thinks he has melanoma. And she thinks, in her opinion, and we don't have all the tests yet, but what she thinks is that he doesn't really have a lung cancer. He has melanoma that went undetected and untreated and spread to the rest of his body. So in other words, they brought my father to this facility because of how great the medical attention is. He basically got no medical attention whatsoever. He had melanoma, which could have been cured probably a few years ago, but they did nothing about it, and they wait until it's basically infected his entire body. And now I have no idea how much more time he has left to live. I mean, I don't know that he's even going to live to get out. Unbelievable. I, mean, I know this is hard for you, but I probably had your dad on, let's not exaggerate, 30 times. I got him, helped get him on the GCN Radio Network, helped get him syndicated, probably one of the reasons he got in so much trouble. His show got very popular, got picked up by a bunch of radio stations. And I tell you, usually I don't like to go out to eat and you know talk about politics with folks because I get enough of it already. I just Your dad was so fun to eat dinner with. I probably had dinner with your dad 10 times. And it personally gets to me to think about him being tortured like this. Oh, and, he's, and, and, and then he's, I think about you, his son, what you must be going through. I mean, he should be out of prison right now. He's a political so dissident. Hard. Just to see him there, you know, all by himself, withering away, maybe 140 pounds, he's skin and bones, he's not eating, he's all by himself, you know, he's starting to lose his mental capacity, probably dementia. Meanwhile, you know, everybody I talk to says, yes, we're, we, the people at the prison want him out, right? But he's still not out. The bureaucracy, the wheels turn so slowly, we can't even get a dying man out of prison. We have to sit him in a hospital with armed guards shackled to a bed. He's got no visitors, there's He's no blind. family members around, and basically the prison system killed him. He's been in jail for 10 years already. It was a 13-year sentence, which really was a death sentence for a nonviolent so-called crime, basically standing up for his constitutional rights, standing up for the American people, trying to get the government to abide by the Constitution, and this is what they do to him. And they could do it to any of us. Uh, if people don't have empathy, they're insane.
But I think people, maybe your audience, maybe we can do something to demand that 